Yes, Beyond the Style Wars, Daniel Morales and David Andriozzi. And um, well, it's interesting because um, certainly with those gentlemen, we've had a little bit of saber rattling of ideas in the past, but um, I think these gentlemen are here to make peace and I wanna hear what they have to say. So I'm going to stop my share now and uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Morales. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Nir and Patrick and everybody else who's made these uh, last few days you know, very interesting for me and I think for a lot of us. Um, one thing that's, that I've enjoyed is to see the, to use a classical phrase, the unity and diversity that I found in everyone's ideas. So while our styles and approaches are different, it, 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 it's obvious that we're all going in the same direction. Um, so today, I wanted to, uh, we'd like to explore how to move beyond the style wars that have plagued the debate between modernists and traditionalists for the last 75 years. So David will, and I will offer ideas on how to break the stalemate and hopefully inspire others to do the same in this session. So without further ado, um, I will let David start off his presentation. One second. Okay, um, can everybody see the screen? Yep. Yes, yep, the full screen, is it in the full screen mode? Um, not yet. Not entirely. Not yet, no, okay. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, hi, uh, my name is David Andriozzi. Um, I've spent many years advocating quite simply uh, for good design all, all around. Um, I was involved nationally with the AIA and I'm the current president of the New England chapter of the ICAA. I'm not an architectural historian or an architectural theorist. My point in presenting my idea is not to change the history books. It's simply a lifelong search for a new solution. What, what we've been doing for a century is not working. We need a new peaceful message, one that we can build and improve our built world by respecting our natural world and the people that came before us based on tradition. To be clear, this short presentation is not that peaceful message. Rather, this is intended to explain the way we might go beyond the style wars and simply respect context and culture. So between friends, let's start with polemics. We've been brainwashed on aesthetics for a hundred years by glossy magazines that led the public opinion, by college institutions that taught us, by professional associations that were supposed to be our guardians. And they did it by celebrating superficial design. Excuse me. Um, consider this, the Empire State, oh, architecture is designed with resilience. And I don't mean resilient engineering, although that's equally important. I mean design in, in resilient design. Its imagery needs to be relatable to people to be loved by current and future generations. Consider this, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, and the RCA Building. They were all built about 90 years ago, about two to three years apart. Does anyone here doubt that any of those three buildings will not be here 90 years from today? More to the point, on these buildings 180th birthdays, 90 years from today, year 2111, will one single building from the $25 billion Hudson Project be, exist? In all seriousness, the answer is in resilient design. It's connectivity to people, history, and culture that it serves. It is key to the building's, the public's acceptance of it. There is, in my opinion, there are three types of 20th century modernism as I understand it. Two are corrupt and one is romantic. The first is the international style, a movement we know born from the industrial revolution intended to unite the world into one. Unfortunately, their solution was to do this by whitewashing culture, history, and vernacular in the name of a new world. As an aside, 
When we use the word modern to describe the international style, we are drinking their Kool-Aid. We are propagating their dream. And in doing so, we are eating our own young. The word modern is good. I am sure Vitruvius and uh, the engineer and genius Sir Edwin Luchens would agree. The second modernism is much worse. It is an even less Vitruvian archetype. I will call it cardboard modern. Michael Graves' earliest homes, along with others, provided the foundation of sculpture in many cases without any respect to vernacular. They began rotting and leaking within days, not years or decades. I visited this project in 1979. You can see it was built in, it was 12 years old or so. Um, I visited when I was at University of Cincinnati. It was a rainy day. It was with the project manager who would, was working under him at the time at, when it was built. It was literally leaking. It was leaking. In, there, were, there were four buckets with water falling down from the ceiling, and they were emptying the buckets as our class had a tour of the building. Grave gave us dispo disposable containers to live in, which made him famous, but the structures were cardboard sculpture. They were not Vitruvian. They were not architecture. This exact sin became, sin became the norm over the next four decades, designing sculpture irrespective to context and vernacular, and secondarily then adding program to it. This is the Snyderman House. We visited it on the same day. This slide I, I requested from Michael Graves firm when I was doing a lecture on it about 15 years ago. And you can see in the upper right, it's rotting away on their picture. It's already starting to rot away. When I saw it, it was five years old or so, seven years old. It was literally falling apart like paper mache. And then there's the design virus, what it muted to something worse. Architects started throwing toilet paper on the floor and proclaiming the shape a new winery, or is it a museum, or is it an Olympic hockey rink, or really is it a five-holer outhouse? Welcome to Cardboard Modern. Any freshman architect can do it with the same remedial results, that of a third grader. And then there's good 20th century modern idealism, a belief that the world was going to be a better place, described in, by the Jetsons and their dog Astro. In the dream of Tomorrowland at Disney, Oops. In the 1964 World's Fair in New York, a dream of a new improved world, one that was only recently huddled in poisonous smog, pollution, slavery, labor improprieties, racial and gender discrimination, diseases, world wars, etc. Quite simply, a modern that was a desire for a better world for our, ch our children. This modernism is what we need, we need to embrace in Vitruvian architecture. We need to take back ownership of the word modern. I submit that it was part of our traditional ethos, but it was stolen from us. I argue that the true birth of modernism may have been the birth of the picturesque in the 1700s, a quiet revolt to pivot from pure impersonal classicism, born of Vitruvius and later of the Renaissance in search of soul and place in art and then in architecture. We know the term genius loci from classic Roman, classic, classical Roman religion. The spirit of a place, perhaps the solution as simple as that, to remain stewards and guardians of our indigenous cultures and vernaculars. Many argue that the 17th century French art movement, a true search for pastoral and, and lime was the beginning. As an aside, perhaps Edwin, Edmund Burke's almost 200 year old interpretation of beauty and sublime needs to be revisited, redefined and modernized, but we'll save that for another day. As I understand it, the picturesque starts in earnest with, with William, sorry, with William Gilpin, a clergyman, a schoolmaster and a writer on aesthetics, best known for his publications, essay on prints, and observations, uh, the river, observations on the River Wye, published in 1770. 
In these writings and other, he describes tours through the British landscapes and how to view and evaluate their inherent beauty, what to admire, what not to admire. His writings become an important part of a larger movement uh, that would define the Romantic period. The word picture, before the invention of photography, referred to a drawing or an image. To Gilprin, it is my interpretation that the word picturesque referred to the type of beauty within that artistic drawing or search for individual soul of place as it relates to site vernacular and culture. Can one argue that this movement in art gave birth to America's legendary landscape painter, Thomas Cole? In his short 47 years, Cole's work would influence a new generation of American painters, mastering an artistic philosoph philosophical movement of his time, the ideals of the picturesque. Cole's development of his work and his influence on other artists would later be known, known as the Hudson Valley River School. But Cole doubled down. Not only did he produce the, celebra the, the art that celebrated their time and place, but there was much more. Yes, the beautiful trees, the streams were all clearly essential to the ethos, but further, they were about discovering the soul and the history of contemporary culture and embedded social commentary on the zeitgeist of the moment. Issues like the negative impact of the industrial revolution, such as clearing land for trains, resulting po pollutions, patronizing of Indian land became fodder for each and every painting. I believe that Cole viewed social responsibility of art as a type of political activism. The story will continue in a moment, but first I need to talk green and food because it's sort of indirectly tied to our solution. I'm sorry, green is not a bean counting formula that we call lead. I don't put green principles ahead of architecture as a whole. Building with the environment and culture in mind should be simply a responsibility of every architect and designer. It is about doing what's right for our world, our labor force, our environment. We are leaders, but perhaps, just perhaps, green is short for the picturesque. Consider people like the great Jane Goodall, Consider the horror of American Samoa, where 250 Vietnamese garment workers, mostly women, were stranded in internment camps in terrible conditions, starved and sexually abused by their bosses while they made clothing. So how does this, how is this relevant? Because, oops, because since America Samoa was a US territory, these garments were being sold by national labels, including the Gap, Walmart, JCPenney, Sears and Roebuck, proudly labeled Made in America. To me, we have to ask questions up and down the chain, and we are only starting to. About 10 years ago, Foxconn, Apple's biggest supplier in China, employees were committing suicide by jumping out of windows, all locked to low pay, and long hours. Yes, they actually installed nets outside the manufacturing facilities, dormitories, to help to reduce the amount of suicides that were occurring on a regular basis. We heard the news. Did we really care? Care enough to protest in the streets or not buy Apple products? No, because in a way we're all side of we're all guilty. We all love our cheap products. The food industry is an interesting self-critical industry of its own. They understand the importance of educating their consumers from within and respect of critics are truly independent. Consider Upton Sinclair's famous book, The Jungle, almost a century ago, an expose of Chicago meat parking district and the brutal re realities of that. More recently, 1986, the slow food movement, we all know it, it only started decades ago. It started because of the protest of a McDonald's opening up on the Spanish steps in Rome. Because of that, people started eating local foods. Further, what's in season? If we support local farmers, fruit is fresher. Fruit is fresher. It's better for you and you're supporting your local economy, your local neighbor, your friends, and your family. In only three decades, this movement has changed the world as to how we look at things. Up and down in restaurants and in markets everywhere. We ask the question now, is it in season? Is it organic? Is it even more now, even more now, is it fed with antibiotics? Is it genetically modified? 
I love shrimp. I always have an emergency bag of shrimp in the freezer, ready to go. It was only five years ago that I learned that most of the grocery store shrimp that we buy, including me, was toxic garbage. I learned that if you look closely at the behind the writing of the name, the bold title name of the shrimp company, it's often imported, grown in places like Indonesia and China in huge industrial tanks made or made in mud ponds. The shrimp live their lives in a bath of their own feces and are fed man-made food pellets with antibiotics so they can live in their own sewage. Sounds yummy, right? We also learned that you can buy wild shrimp for slightly more money from the Gulf and other places. They're muscular they're, because they're wild. It makes them crunchier because they actually swim for a living. They're 10 times more delicious, but who knew? So what lessons can we learn from, can the architecture world learn? Let me start by showing you what we lost. In my opinion, that same social movement that I described in art and food was developing in the picturesque a search for identity and place, but with a respect of tradition. Here are a few examples I'll go by quickly over the last 150 years. John Nash, Anthony Salvin, Richard Norman Shaw, Sir Ernest, Sir Ernest George, and then there's the legend Edwin Lutyens. To me, these architects, their fellow landscape architects and other co-artisans were clearly experimenting, trying to merge classical principles with those of the picturesque. It was about development as opposed to copying. Let me rephrase that. It was about learning from the past and using that knowledge to modernize or reinterpret canons of the past based on local people and local vernacular. Again, where this gets in, oh, sorry. Where this gets interesting is like the picturesque art movement that morphed with Thomas Cole's art, so it does in architecture. Because architects in America, we were, they were paying attention to the movement across the pond and they began to search for the same unique cultural vernacular idiosyncrasies in our own regional architectures. One of the earliest to emerge was Charles McKim's Isaac Bell House in Newport, completed in 1883, a critical movement in the evolution of modernism in its open floor plan and further connection from the interior to the exterior. Consider at the time that most of the homes in Newport were classical mansions, but this design seemed to break those rules with a different compositional order and tried to be a representative of its time, of its place, of its people, and of its past. And only five years later, Stanford White would design the legendary William G. Lowe House in Bristol, Rhode Island, which is, in my opinion, one of the most important houses ever created in America. A design that further modernized, further refined, further simplified, and further moved architecture toward the picturesque ethos, resulting in even more of a reflection of New England in its place, in its genius loci. Tragically, this masterpiece was raised in 1962. I would argue the same exact picturesque rule set would show up in the works of Green and Green established in Pasadena in the 1890s as they reinvented the bungalow. Considered Frank Lloyd Wright remodeled his first family home beginning around the same time, a little after, with the same style, a simplified American archetype. Here are two familiar Wright quotes that prove his commitment of a connection to place, people, and architecture. The first, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature, it will never fail you. Secondly, no house should ever be on a hill or anything. It should be of the hill, belonging to it. House and hill should live together and they'll be happier for each other going forward. These are only a few examples of such architects. At the turn of the last century, there was a world that was on a path to try and understand and interpret the soul of place and architecture, again, with the foundation of tradition in the past. Unfortunately, this is where everything went completely off the rails. 
This is when modernism in our world's landscape architecture and art became diseased. And like Philox, Philoxera, I never pronounced that correctly, um, this new modernist philosophy methodically ate at the roots of architecture. It was called modernism, but as I mentioned earlier, it was not modern, it was the international style. William Gilprin couldn't imagine such a beast, that such a beast would ravage the history of history and culture from our world. So let's start by giving the Vitruvian man a break after 2000 years and give the Zuforian woman a chance. A patron of contextual and cultural sustainability, the ultimate synthesis influenced by the picturesque vernacular, both cultural and topographic, and regionalism in respect to natural resources and labor. At this moment, as I've discussed, we need a new narrative, one without polemics. To be clear, polemics are needed as much as education, but I would argue that neither one alone or combined will overwin the masses to get us where we wanna to get to. We need a new movement with a simple ethos that can unite all organizations fighting for classicism and tradition, traditional values today and be in competition with none of them. Ideally, this new code or rule set would have no dues, no hierarchy, but would have a strong and poignant and resonant message to protect, preserve, and, and nurture classical and traditional architecture and the arts, arts. With a simple message, what is it about buildings that make you feel good? They are, they are familiar and friendly, and they remind us of and relate, us, relate to the past, nature, and the people before us. That is it. No arca speak. Any third grader can understand it. Quite simply, contextual sustainability and cultural sustainability can be a style blind code to judge all architecture, traditional or modern. I believe that this message is ubiquitous enough to be accepted by all and if followed, more great classical architecture will follow, more great traditional architecture will follow, and perhaps maybe a new modern architecture will be invented. So again, I challenge you to reconsider everything you know about the word modern. Modern is good. Embrace it. Love it. Own it. Protect it. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. And uh, Mr. Morales, it's back to you. Okay. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Obviously, being someone who loves pretty pictures, that's that was easy. But um, that's some, a lot of stuff to... I love that you're just taking the word modern back because obviously I've never considered myself anything but. And everyone who's born is always a modern person. So um, anyway, so I will get into mine. Let's see how I do this. Okay. Does everyone see that plaza? Can you see that? Yes, we do. Great, thank you. All right. Um, hello, <clears throat> my name is Daniel Morales. Uh, I'm a, the company architect for Parkwood Homes, a traditional neighborhood development builder. Today, I'd like to propose a humanist framing for architecture one that prioritizes the public on whose ground and whose site we build. This means that architects have a greater responsibility for the, to the common good when working in the public realm. Reinforcing the idea that people are the final arbiters of what is a good building establishes a baseline to which all architects are accountable. By now the story of modernism's rise and the many takedowns of its failed promises are well known. But despite our best efforts, academia still clings to a dogma that rejects tradition and the lessons it has to offer. In the meantime, our built environment continues to be degraded by a disposable architecture with no sense of place. In the face of a rapidly urbanizing planet with dwindling resources, these lessons are all the more important if we want to build cities worth preserving. I propose that we're better off accepting modernism as just another style because that's how the public views it. 
Even though polls show a majority prefer traditional architecture, there's a sizable majority, minority, sorry, that doesn't. This doesn't mean abandoning the values we hold dear, but rather we need to show how they can raise all boats in the effort to build a humane and sustainable environment. Buildings like people have a responsibility to work together in the public realm, reaffirming architecture's traditional role in the service and for the pleasure of the public allows us to move beyond the politics of style and focus on, what, on what's best for the user. After all, it's hard to speak for the common good while crowing about the superiority of one's favorite style. In order to move forward, we must first look back to when style was a matter of temperament. Classicism spread across Europe with its associations of Roman grandeur. While some architects strove for orthodoxy, others developed their own manner coining the term mannerism. By the 18th century, neoclassicism sprang up in reaction to the excesses of the Baroque. Classicism's lexicon continued to expand as archeologists uncovered new sources of inspiration. At the, same, at the same time, globalization introduced foreign styles and ideas about beauty. As the economist Adam Smith noted, in different climates, and where different customs and ways of living take place, different ideas of beauty prevail. It soon became obvious that classicism wasn't the only game in town. What began as a taste for the picturesque resulted in the revival of vernacular traditions. The asymmetry found in picturesque composition widened the range of harmonious beauty beyond the rules of classicism. While the Beaux-Arts Academies were based on Vitruvian principles, their graduates applied both methods of composition to a variety of building types. Where the one chose to imitate, emulate, or invent mattered less than how well they could design. Eclecticism was the natural result of the middle class's appetite for beauty and status. As the French philosopher Stendhal said, there are as many styles of beauty as there are visions of happiness. The democratization of taste led some to think that architecture had become too commercialized and style an interchangeable garment relying on fashion. With the increased availability of pattern books and the in invention of photography, architects could now draw from a variety of styles. Yet this orgy of beauty didn't sit well with everybody. Reformers such as Pugin and Ledoux articulated a rationalist theory of architecture based on structural honesty, while others emphasized social issues. As architects continued to offer new visions of beauty, the reform, the, the call for reform grew louder. What started as a fringe movement before the First World War entered the mainstream of those countries who'd suffered the most. A new generation of architects sought a clean break from the past by embracing a functionalist ideology. With little work to be had, they wrote manifestos declaring abstract minimalism to be the only legitimate expression of modernity. In America, the situation was the exact opposite. Architects had little time for social commentary and worker housing during the building boom of the Roaring Twenties. While European modernism occasionally appeared in periodicals, there was little appetite for its Spartan aesthetic until the Great Depression. With the world economy in freefall, modernism's emphasis on social and economic issues looked increasingly attractive to a young architect facing unemployment. There was only one problem. As the Museum of Modern Art explained in its catalog for their exhibition on the international style, quote, this lack of ornament is one of the most difficult elements of the style for the layman, unquote. Today, the same cities which modernists railed against are some of our most beloved. So how could these places filled with pattern book architecture be so popular? The reason is simple. They were designed to please people as they are and not as modernists wish them to be. Their ideology was based on a magical line in time where tradition ended and modernity began. Like their political counterparts, modernists demanded a revolution sweeping all other, all other ideas aside. According to their argument or one of their arguments the introduction of the steel frame construction system 
had invalidated styles derived from load-bearing masonry. This assumed architects in the past had been preoccupied with structural honesty, contrary to everything they said and built. <clears throat> Take medieval timber frame construction, for an example, that was plastered to look like stone. I doubt anyone who's admired these buildings has ever thought that they were being lied to. In order to move beyond this tired debate, we must look towards science. Just, and I would argue towards the things uh, my friend David also introduced, but just like the original humus, humanists who embraced classical empiricism, science now shows that human nature has been modern for thousands of years. It turns out evolution does not track with technology. One of the reasons for the continued popularity of historic styles is their reliance on the physical laws and geometries that underlie our attraction to nature. Living things employ the same principles of harmonious beauty, such as pattern, proportion, and balance to propagate life. As the, environmentalist, uh, as the environmental biologist E.O. Wilson wrote, beauty is, quote, our word for the qualities that have contributed most to human survival. Studies show the brain is most aroused by patterns which exhibit the same degree of complexity found in many traditional designs. Too much repetition results in monotony, while too much variability causes us stress. For chance, this, is, this, is the, this is, I guess, the definition of the Aristotelian mean. These preferences are backed up by advances in neurology, which show the interrelationship between emotion and reason. Far from being distinct, emotions help us process large amounts of visual information quickly in order to determine whether something is good for us or not. This explains why we feel uncomfortable walking on streets with large blank walls and favor those with human scaled fabric. Elements such as vertical windows and ornament humanize a building while creating a friendly feeling because of its interest to the passerby. Another reason for the popularity of traditional architecture has to do with the building's emotional tone. Just as we make ourselves presentable when going out in public, historic styles evolve to do the same. This is especially true when one considers that up until recently, most of life happened in the public realm. Traditional architecture is a reflection of our humanity with all our idiosyncrasies and our desire to be loved. As Henry Hope Reed said, quote, man does not build for himself alone any more than he smiles for himself alone. The facade is designed out of respect to the beholder, a form of architectural courtesy to the man on the street. This idea is all the more important when context has a unique character. For those sites which stand alone or at the edge of town, a building has less reason to get along with others. But like any civil gathering, one must adjust their behavior for the greater good. Whatever else our clothes communicate, people will instinctively read the effort to make ourselves presentable. As the urban planner Camilo Cite put it best, Major plazas and thoroughfares should, win the, should wear their Sunday best in order to be a pride and joy to their inhabitants. This doesn't discount other readings architecture gives us, but as Schinkel said, delight first, instruct second. The traditional city is a city of facades, the quality of which affect our experience when walking down a street. As Alberti wrote, the parts of the building most on display to the public deserve the most handsome treatment. Throughout, our, throughout history, architects in, employed style as a means of producing a beautiful composition. The fact that eclectics drew from a variety of styles didn't absolve them of the need to harmonize the parts any more than Renaissance architects who chose from the various fragments of antiquity. The value of traditional styles to urbanism is the sense of harmony they bring to a street, regardless of one's skill as a designer. A well-known example is the painted ladies of San Francisco. Buildings that were once derided by fashionable architects of their day are now seen as a gift to the street. It was in a meeting with developers where the different deficiencies of our architectural system became fully apparent. I was told that there was an unmet demand for architects who could design a well-composed building. 
Just because craftsmanship is out of, out of reach for most people doesn't mean we can't have beauty. The problem is we no longer teach the art of architecture. So students aren't prepared to serve the pub a public whose aesthetic sense has remained unchanged for thousands of years. As a result, we're increasingly reliant on form-based codes to achieve what used to come naturally. Considering this need, it's evident that the way we train our architects is failing them, and more importantly, the communities they work in. The key to change is reforming academia. This requires us to articulate a defense of traditional architecture based on human nature and environmental stewardship. Without the beauty that makes cities like Paris a pleasure to walk in, we will never build places worth preserving. After all, we tend to save those things we love the most. So while modernism is here to stay, it can be humanized to work better in the public realm. A humanist framing returns beauty to its rightful place as an essential component of good architecture, one that is allows us to move beyond the politics of style and focus on architecture that's in the service and for the pleasure of the public. So that is my, the end of my presentation. Um, so David, you're muted, but if you wanted to make any comments, I have plenty to say about your presentation. That was fantastic. You, that was just great. So you said you had some questions? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, for example, I, I just a bit, uh, we're trying to initiate a debate, see what you all think about our ideas and, you know, attack our ideas and propose your own ideas. Politely. Um, but um, so one of the things that intrigued me about your presentation was the idea of the three modernisms and, um, and, 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 and a way of recapturing that term. You know, the, uh, modernism stole the word style from us. Style is, everyone knows what style is. It's not a dirty word. You know, it doesn't mean you're thinking deeply or shallowly, shallow, you know, uh, lightly. It just is a way to communicate a visual language. Uh, beauty is subjective and objective. We both understand, we all understand elements that, you know, a realtor couldn't say, oh, it has great sex appeal to a client and the client go, well, that depends. You and I have different, no, we all speak about a universal beauty yet, okay, that's not my taste, fine. Um, and of course, modern, you know. So one of the things I think we need to do is to just change the semantics of this. Can you talk more about how that works in, in, in the way you frame this? I mean, I, there are two ways that I look at it. One is um, I've only had an opportunity to go to one of Lutchen's projects, the British Embassy. And it was recently at a design leadership event. And I walked through with three other pretty cl classical, traditional uh, artisans, um, two architects. And detail after detail, it was, it, it blew us away. It was, he was, he was playing music at a level that I had never heard before. He, I was seeing details there that I wouldn't let off my own drafting table because I don't think they work. And they were beautiful. They were, he was experimenting at every level with classical traditional detailing. So that's one level. But then those slides that I finished off with, some of the greatest are considered not classical, but traditional architects at the turn of last century. I mean, they were moving, trying to move the, the world forward. Does that mean that everything has to be that? No, but we need to ref we need a new narrative that encourages not just our, our lake or, or our sea to rise, which is classical and traditional architecture. We need the world's ocean to rise so that traditional architecture, uh, classical architecture and modern architecture in all different variants starts to improve. And if you simply say, you know what, can you try and do that by ab abiding to with respect of people, history and vernacular or some variant of that? Well, it's amazing what, and if we sat here, we could come up with 20 projects right now that are good examples of modern architecture that do do that. My point is, is that the word modern, we need to stop taking the cheese. Like that's an insult. It's the international style. And the stuff that's happening now, which is sculpture with program put on it, that's that's embarrassing. I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered your question, 
But and the other th question is, you know, where do we go from here? Because I don't think the solution. I think we need all the people in this room, are the, are the people that started the movement. I mean, I think it. You could actually stay. It probably started with learning from Las Vegas and where people started to pivot and started to think about tradition again. That's what I was in in the mid '80s. To go into, I was working at Chopin Warden and started thinking about classical tradition and I'm from Rhode Island. So people started to actually reinvent and find those crafts that were out there and relearn, relearn the crafts. So I think that it's, a, it's happening around us and it's continuous. But the people here that learn from that and that are, are advocating for it, we aren't the solution. We can't make the change by uh, the wonderful institutions the, the, the wonderful, whether it be the ICAA, whether it be Notre Dame, all those people, we're setting up the individual people. But if we're going to make change to the world, we're not going to make awareness by improving 10,000 happy people to 20,000 happy people in 10 years. That makes no difference in the world. We need to get out to the masses. And I actually think that you're starting to see it with young groups like Michael Diamant, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I think he's on right now who I've talked to, who's doing amazing things. And that is not, he's a non-architect. And so is uh, Joseph Justice, who has a group called the Institute of Traditional Architecture, where he you know, celebrates the best traditional architects in the world. This is another non-architect. These are the youth. So the question is, is that how do we get the youth in a social media sort of way to accept our message? And, in my opinion, I got, I got it. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to roll. In my opinion, it's last night's video. Last night's video, who was there? Martha Stewart's there. I could come home and I could say to my wife, who actually is interested, but if she wasn't, say, hey, Martha Stewart's going to be the commentator. And you know what? You know what? All of a sudden, people care. So you get people like, whether it be Martha Stewart or Oprah Winfrey or Kanye West, who's made active ch ch uh, 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 reaches to try and change architecture. You get Moby, who was a, a musician who had an architecture blog, Jay-Z, people with tens of millions of followers to say, you know, I just think that architecture, the environment should relate to nature and people. And guess what? All of our tents are going to go a little higher to a second story. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. No, that was great. Um, no, it's just that you provoke so many ideas. I just, uh, and I want everyone to, you know, whoever wants to unmute and bust in, that's great. But I just want to touch back to one thing that um, you had said, like getting young people interested. When I, I started drawing for fun because my because I liked in the neighborhood, I came from Italy to America and I just looked around the, the neighborhoods because I was bored and it was a 1920s neighborhood with all these different styles. And, and you know, I wanted to imagine myself uh, a, 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 a more popular kid. So I'd look at the nice house. Then, uh, then I looked at floor plans. So long story short, I was drawing buildings before I got to college. And then they started telling me this nonsense. They literally told me, forget everything you learned. I mean, that's, that's, in, that's impossible. Like that's literally impossible. So I just thought to myself, what, what's, what game is going on here? What's, and obviously you learn it very quickly. But um, so, so the thing with young people is I just wanted to get in there and draw something nice that my mom, my neighbor would say, hey, that's pretty, just like if you were a musician. So to go back to the, you know, to bring it back down to the, to, to where a young person's interested, you mentioned Lutchens. Lutchens, when the styles changed, he moved on to a more Edwardian classical phase, but he was still Lutchens by temperament. You know, temperament, I think, is more important than style. That's just the way he approached it versus someone who's more intellectual. So he called Palladio, he said, the game is Palladio. You know, and what, a, and what a wonderful way game it is. The idea is that if you really love design, it is a game. It's, it's you know, you, you layer in all the reason, all the culture, all these other things, but you're never going to get that sweet beauty if you don't let people play with those crayons. And again, I'm not trying to simplify it. You have to go really high to go low. But if you want to get the, the, the people designing from the ground up, you have to tell them that this is fun. It's a live tradition. And please make me happy. And, and that I think will be, people love making each other happy. And that's, I, t that's what I do and every day. And, and, and it works, to be honest with you. People enjoy being pleased. I totally agree. I mean, one of the things that we talk about um, is at the ICA is that we present the argument to real estate agents. We tour locally in New England, and we've had these panels and we'll explain to real estate agents 
the importance of resale value in traditional and classical architecture. It, I mean, and so and when when it's presented like that, you're not saying I hate modernism, but you're saying, hey, do you know that using traditional concepts and classical concepts are going to you're going to maintain more resale value in your house? Well, that's just the art. That, okay, that's pretty easy to to to, to swallow. So uh, it's going to take many different arguments for sure. Yeah, and, and if they do like modernism. They like modernism and I've done modernist work and I've enjoyed it because it can be a game. It's, I don't just do some cube and then sell them a bunch of words. They have to be delighted by it. So I think it's, but between you and me, I used to hate modernism because they hated me in school. And I mean, I got thrashed at every crit, but hatred never got me very far. And all I did was knock heads with modernists. And as my mother used to say, don't say hate, say dislike. So, okay, I dislike some modern architecture. But the truth is, everyone has a right to, to express themselves. The point I was trying to make is, in the public realm, whatever your personal predilection is, you have to, you have to conform to, to, make a, to make a more harmonious whole. That works in society as it does in aesthetics, on a street. And that's, I think, something that, that students can, can get behind, that it's about working well together. Just the way like diversity and pluralism and all those catchwords. I mean, that's what we're talking about on a beautiful street. Did you? I mean, the question is, did you really hate modernism did you, or did you hate exactly what we've been talking about for the last two and a half days, which is the lack of respect for context and culture? And so- you, we, we no, forced, no, I hated modernism. No, well, you hated the international style and you hated the stripping yeah, right. of I culture. Um, so that's where, again, we need to get rid of the M word because that's what we hated and that's what we were taught. I mean, I've done, it's taken me years as I do juries to get the modernist philosophy out of my head that I was taught in college. That's how bad it was. That's how, how badly we were brainwashed. But we need to look at things differently from the perspective of, of being a guardian for a community, of its context. Well, and the other thing that I've said before, a lot of this modern stuff, I mean, with rare exceptions, it's not going to be here in 200 years because it's not going to be loved. It's going to fail because of technology and people are going to lose connectivity to it because they have no connectivity to it. And it's just going to be ripped down and replaced, maybe with something traditional classical. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll amend my statement based on what you just said. I didn't, I didn't hate modernists uh, and I don't really hate modern architecture. It just leaves me so bored. Like when I was young, I, you know, my mom would say, look at that stupid looking building. And I'd be like, yeah, this friggin' a grid. I mean, it's the grid that they forgot to draw the building on. But, you know, so, so no, I, I don't hate it. I just hated how badly I got thrashed because I never, to be honest, I never bought this stuff when I got to school. So consequently, I never did very well in design. And the last semester I told myself, all right, I'm going to do everything perfect. I'm going to make, the, I'm going to perfect attendance, perfect sections, models, this, you know, function. My, I, my, I always used to think my cover would be, I, I completed this program within 98% of the requirements. So in theory, I'll, I'll get a job when I leave. But the truth is when those, the, the, the young star architect wannabes would get up there, that program was like a joke. It's like you were given this program like that actually meant something. And then when, when you presented, they literally, one guy said, oh, I derived all these sketches I did with my eyes closed. I'm thinking to myself, is anyone else gonna say anything? And so you can see this in every jury, you'll be sitting in a jury and you'll look at the, because we're all the same, right? We all read each other, we know what's happening. And you'll see the kids' faces, like it's just, they're all glazed over. They're all getting hypnotized. I mean, some of them are thinking, all right, I'm gonna ride this thing all the way to the bank and, and good for them, they're good salespeople. But the rest of them are thinking, what is this? And I would tell these stories to my mom and she would say, where's Benny, you know, in her little thick Venezuelan accent, she'd say, I'm spending all that money on this for you to get that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, don't worry, mom, they think you're an idiot anyway. So, you know, whatever. But obviously, as we all know from our family members, you don't need a degree to be smart. You know, you so, just. I, I mean, I, I was to, to, to tell you a little bit more about my experience in 1979 when I visited these two houses for Michael Graves. The first time, and, and I have to tell you, Everybody on this on this group knows those are the two most monumental houses. The the, the book, the whole thing, the New York Five, that really set the, the the stage for architecture. You know, leaving out of the 1900s, I think going into the 20th century. I walked in. I come. My, my father's a carpenter and a contractor. I grew up with a, a hammer and, and drag. Well, actually, started with 
dragging junk to the dumpster. And then eventually I got a hammer. But I grew learning craft my entire life through high, high school and junior high school. And so I'm walking through this house, which is, again, whatever it was, 12 years old. It's literally rotting away. I was looking outside. Every piece of beam outside was rotting away. You could stick your fingers through. We're sitting there at the time. The professor was Peter Waldman, who I believe is at, um, at uh, University of Virginia for years. I don't know where he is now, who, 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 was, who was guiding the tour, talking to the owners. And I'm watching them talk to each other with streams of water falling into the room as young students are walking around. There's the pretty effort and the architecturally, in other words, let me, from a, from a cardboard standpoint, from a, from what you would learn in school, it was magnificent. It was a bar relief. It was a huge cube, an amazing hand painting in the back. It was everything that you would give an A to, to a, a modern architecture student. Us sitting there with this older couple that invested in this structure with their nest egg and the house was falling apart in 12 years with streams of water falling into galvanized buckets. That is disgusting. And then again, the other one, which was only five or seven years old, Schneiderman House, it was falling apart with like paper mache. I mean, it was, it was just absolutely atrocious. I'm sorry, I digress. No, that's all right. And I wanna encourage someone to step in and say, you know, you're wrong. Or what about this? You know, um, because that's that, that's what we're trying to provoke here. It's it's um, you know how to how to how to get this beyond this debate. I mean, personally, I love every effort to to do this from the right, from the left, whatever your politics are, whatever. But um, but me personally, I feel like we have to get into universities. Um, that's where the students are, and 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 that means finding common ground. And that's why I stress environmentalism. I mean, when you when you build well, you you protect that town, and if you protect that town, you're protecting our nature. And we need this. We can't keep spreading and spreading and spreading. So that means we have to build a place where we actually like to be that encourages socialization. And you know, you can go through the science route, you can go through the environmentalist route. I I just was interested in making people smile, and then they told me no, 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 and I just thought, what kind of insane world is this? If I'm just trying to show you a flower, so then I have to study and study and study just so that I don't sound stupid. But at the end of the day, it, you know, we have this naturally in us. And so I'm all for theory. God knows I, I read books to the, you know, quote this, quote that. But my daughter, you know, I give her a piece of paper. Then I look at it in an hour when she was young. Now she's got a lot of attitude. I looked at it, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's not just because it's my daughter, but she composes it lovely. She does this, she does, and then she shows me, she says, Ma, you know, Dad, what do you think? She wants me to like it. I mean, uh, Roger Scruton has said as much. You know, when we, when we talk about beauty, it's so that we draw each other close to each other. Or Henry Hope Reed said the same. We don't smile alone. I mean, now and then we smile alone. But, you know, it's, it's about, anyway, so I'm getting a little hippie there, but um, Dan, somebody asked, somebody asked, how do you explain modern music? Easy. I mean, how do you explain anything? People are allowed to do what they want. And if you want to make cacophonous sounds and, and that does it for you, it doesn't do it for me, but you're entitled to do that. But if you play it in public, I want to ask you to please, just like a barking dog or a loud boom box, you just have to be respectful. But I don't have to tell you what to like or why to like it. You might be liking it to sound slick to get you know, to get some action downtown, whatever, you know, it just, it's, 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 that's, that's to me is freedom. We, we just don't have to agree. It's just that when we get together, we have to be agreeable. I just wish that Ed, Edwin Lutchens was here um, and we could ask him what his perspective would be and what he would be working on and what he would be trying to invent um, based on historic canons. I mean, that's that's how I see it. That's what how I look at great architecture is people experimenting. Um, isn't that what we celebrate all the time? Even in history classes, we look at all different variants of true classicist orders and things like that. And so that needs to be our focus. Yeah, I mean, I, I always look at things from the perspective of the designer. Like when I read all these things, I find these quotes where, you know, uh, the Pope tells Michelangelo, fammi qualche cosa nuova, you know, fantasia nuova, which means just create something new to, to entertain me. 
or, you know, or luncheons when he went from the arts and crafts to the classical. And then that last picture you showed where he had those, you know, checkerboard buildings. I mean, he's obviously responding to the styles of the times. He's just going to do it his way. So in other words, like, you know, even Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, he's doing all his little thing and all the European moderns were saying, oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. And then they leave him in the dust and everyone goes with the new kids, you know, with the, the technology and this. And he knows in his heart that stuff's soulless, but he hates that he's not center of the town, you know, with his cape and his incredible vanity. So he says, all right, let me, let me try that. Let me try that tune. Like, you know, think of it as a musician. He says, what's that song like? He says, I can play that. And he picks up his banjo and you get falling water. I mean, who's going to look at falling water and say that's, that's junk. Now, I totally, now, totally on agree. Hand, but on the other hand, think of a street full of falling waters. And that's where the, the plain old vernacular, simple building becomes important. Yeah, and unfortunately, at that point in the later half of his career, and I'm overgeneralizing, he just he falls off the ocean. He falls off the cliff and starts doing narcissistic geometry, but the, as opposed to relating it to culture and history. But that's a whole different sort of discussion. Um, Pardon my intervention. I, I yes, actually please. have something to say about uh, this whole thing. And I like, here's the thing. I understand that the, like the need to attempt to reconcile modernity and tradition and this whole uh, encompassing of understanding nature, including nature. But I think the word modernity, when it extends beyond uh, what is architecture already becomes like encumbered by some baggage because modernity is not only relevant to architecture, for instance, and I, I personally study uh, administration, political administration, and we see that modern politics dissociates itself from a lot of what is traditional. So we see, for instance, uh, a push for, I would say, even dictatorial equality to the point where there's no recognition that there might be different obligations and uh, needs that people have and that those need to be addressed. For instance, what is needed in the city is not the same as what is needed in the fields right, in, in, in like more rural environments. And I think this also applies naturally to architecture. There's different needs that need to be accounted for. And that's a bit of what the vernacular nature comes from. But I'd say modernity as, as a, a philosophical movement, as it has been present for the past, I'd say 300 years, has sort of tried to reject that sort of tradition and, and I would say contemporaneous traditional architecture, like what is actual modern, one would say modern as in, in the contemporaneous sense, what is occurring right now, traditional architecture must invent, it, but it must innovate, but building upon that tradition, that's what we see in the, in the classics, right? There was, for instance, one could say the Gothic architectural style very traditional, it built upon Romanesque, but it does new things on top of that. It doesn't eliminate what was before. And that's what we see today in, in the international style. It tries to also like politics enforce this sort of uh, dictatorial equality. There's no regional distinction between buildings. That's why it's the international style. There's no place for there to be uniqueness or distinctiveness in the style of building in, in one country versus the another, versus another, right? And I'd say here is where it's important. I, I personally uh, am not really involved in architecture hand, like hands-on, but I'm involved in this reinvindication of traditionalism in the sense of building upon what has already been left and building new ideas on top of it. And I think that's what we need to focus on uh, look at the wider spectrum, that which involves the social, that which involves the understanding of nature, which in the past was uh, a relationship of reciprocity, right? Giving and receiving from nature. Now it's more so dominating nature. And we see this, for instance, in the Cultural Revolution in China, where they uh, industrialized everything and destroyed those Sen beliefs that had the, the, the Chinese were used to be seen as a garden, right? I don't want to keep rambling on about this, but I think it, it's a problem that extends way beyond just the architectural and that we need to consider that there needs to be uh, a reworking of how people think about 
the world and try to reignite that passion of learning from the past, building upon it, not just being, not just imitating what was before, but building new things on top of what already was demonstrated to work and expanding upon that, adjusting what occurred in the past to solve modern problems, to be able to address, for instance, uh, climate concerns, to address social concerns, technology, because all those different things, if we just imitate what happened in Rome, we're not going to be addressing any of those problems. Right, right. Dr. And, Paris? I, yeah, I just want to make sure that we also, uh, um, Patrick and Ina would like to, their hands have been up for a while. Okay, go, actually, go, I, I go for it. Yeah, I'll just real quick. Um, I know what you looked for, Dan, was for somebody to disagree with you, but I hate to disappoint you. I think you and uh, David have it exactly right. Um, I remember when you and I were talking about this in Charleston several years ago, and I think you've really evolved your thinking a lot. I think it comes down to allowing ourselves to be influenced by what works and what the needs are. And as our needs change, some of the results of what that means, it's going to change. Um, it isn't a fear of difference. It isn't a fear of needing to do things different. It's, it's really not allowing doing something different to be the objective. Whenever somebody is trying to be new and different, they just, that, that's just not what we need in our culture right now. We need people to be doing yeah. an architecture. I use a term. I don't know if it's understood on this. Uh, I, I think this group will get it. Often the people I'm appearing before boards don't get it. What I think we need to do is be doing what's what I'd call good architecture. And right. the word good has a real meaning because the opposite is bad architecture. And I think we can demonstrate that there's an awful lot of that in everything, not just in what people want to call international style or modern or whatever, but also when, when people are claiming that what they're trying to do is classical or trying to do traditional. I see a lot of bad architecture there too. Let's try and do good architecture. I think this group is moving that forward in a wonderful way. Thank you all for doing it. Ina, do, can you, you, would you like to put your point? Yeah, there's so much to unpack in this discussion, but I would just like to go back to something that Mr. Morales said um, earlier. Um, if you're outside with a three-year-old child and you give him a stick, which is what happened to me two days ago, the first thing he'll try to do is make scratches in the dirt. And then he'll, he'll just naturally start building with it. He started digging holes in the dirt. He started wanting to fill them with water. He started wanting to build a dam and start to build with the stuff that he had removed from the, the, the hole. So it's absolutely natural. And it's in our genes as human beings, I think to create, to build, to design. And children, as, I mean, as small as two-year-olds, they have opinions. They want things to be a certain way, to look a certain way. So I think the disconnect is much later. And that is, how do you turn this impulse into something that's viable later on? How can people be, I know so many people, I live on an island, so it's a very small environment. Um, there are so many talented people here, but how do you connect that talent to the, the practical world? How do you let these people know, people in general know, that you can actually make a living by creating beautiful environments, that you can be a plaster, a builder, a metal smith, and, and make that a viable proposition? Um, there are, like I say, there are so many talented people here we all have multiple jobs. The metalsmith also does diving and fixes boats. You know, the electrician uh, is also a landscapist. Um, and, and, and it goes on and on and on. The painter, the, the terrazzo maker, I, we have everything here, but it's, it's hidden and it's disconnected from the larger um the larger context and that's just my comment in, in a way we've spent a hundred years trying to convince the public that they don't get it and they're wrong and they need to listen to us and that we're right and i think that what we need to look at which is the opposite is we need to create demand 
And the demand that needs to come not from us, it needs to come from the public. It needs to come from people like Michael Diamond, who's actually has a, I don't even know, like 60,000 people on his on his Facebook page, and they're 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 changing the way that architecture works in their communities. So, and they're not architects; it's the public. So, how do you reach out and get the demand to change? It's yes, we have to keep doing what we're doing from the top down, but it has to come from the bottom up. The demand. Yeah, I would add that the the demand, unfortunately, is 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 the economic system that we're in. Is that there's you can't afford good craftsmanship; only the very rich. And so I feel like if we can produce more beautiful things, even if they're machine made, if this, if they instill a sense of beauty, then people will, will demand something maybe as beautiful, but handcrafted. So to me, it's a vehicle towards opening that up because right now for all the people in Ina's island and all around the world who would naturally be inclined to build beautiful things, there's just not gonna be, at least in my neighborhood, a way to make a living, a way to provide for a family that's easy. So to create the demand, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm not an economist, but something has to, some, you know, I, something has to change. Ina, did you want to put something back in? The, let me let me just buttress that. And if is if by any chance is a, if Gary Brewer is on this, please jump in and unmute yourself because I'm about to butcher one of your wonderful stories. Um, so. I've known him through, I've known Gary um, through the AIA and through the ICA through the years, and we've had many discussions on this. And we got into a long discussion with the fact that under, at Ramza, he was involved with the project that was on the Life magazine, the cover of Life magazine. So that he's was- one of the lead He's one of the lead designers of one of the biggest traditional firms in New York City, just for people who don't know him. Yep, thank you. Robert Stern, Ramza. So he- um, he was telling the story. I, I said, what an amazing thing is that you were able to sell a, basically a stock set of plans of a, of a good design and get it out to the masses. And, and I'm making the number up. I forget whether at the time, it's on the cover of Life, Ma Life Magazine, just look it up, but a beautiful shingle style house. I think at the time it was either $1,800 for the set or $2,800 for the set, but I, I, one or the other. It, they sold millions of, of these copies. And so the fact is, is that if we were to get a dozen shingle style architects and create a book of using the same parts and do that for every region, the solution is there. The demand is there. It, it just has to be focused regionally and based on what people want, not what is being forced down their throat. I mean, look at a lot of the modern architects now, designing museum additions to things that outright saying, I want to disrupt people's experience. I want it to be an uncomfortable experience like society is, and I'm totally comfortable with that. Well, that's what we need to flush down the toilet. So, Ian, I wanted to just, I want you to, to put your thing in for sure, but because Mr. Hamilton just put his hand in, if you can go right after him, oh, yes. and then oh, absolutely. we'll just try to squeeze it in. Much, 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 and he, and, he, and he drew this wonderful classic on the front, front page. He had already moved on from um, that modernist um, buildings that we we're talking, and he, and he had a Damascene um, change of heart. Now, we were discussing, um, uh, the conversation came around to what was going on in modern architecture, in particular, the firm Architectonica, who were building these big modern skyscrapers in Miami. And it's the back, it's the back of, of, of Miami Vice. And Andres Duani was the principal at the time. And then Andres met Leon Creer, and he had a Damascene change of heart. So architects do change their colors. Um, you know, if, if somebody doesn't like their principles, well, as Groucho Marx says, well, they've got other principles, you know. So uh, it is an evolving thing. And I, and I, I think even people like Gropius may, in, the, in turn, if he hadn't died so early, may have also changed it, uh, his viewpoint. Uh, interesting, in Community and Privacy, the first book by Christopher Alexander, 
it is dedicated to Autogropius. It says here, to Autogropius, um, with uh, admiration, affection, and gratitude. And um, I, met, I met Alexander a couple of times, and in the last time, one of the last times I met him was in Providence, Rhode Island at CNU. And I went outside and I, to a, um, an old bookshop, and I came across this, which is notes in the sense of the form. And it's actually, uh, you can see it's stamped um, uh, the, the library of TAC, the Architects Collaborative, which is Autogropius as a library. So there was this kind of interaction between Alexander and Autogropius at that time. So I think what we need to is not sort of say, you know, to people like Peter Eisenman and, and all the star architects so called, is that we need to bring them into a discussion like this and try and understand what's, what's motivating them to build this structure. I mean, uh, I remember meeting Peter Eisenman at, in, in Istanbul in 2006, and he was really miffed that Zaha Hadid was getting all the attention. And he says to me, uh, you know, oh, the, the days of the star architect are about to come to an end. And this was 2005. Well, you know, it was a bit uh, premature, his maturity. And I think um, maybe what we're going through now in this pandemic will be a change of heart from, from you know, architects who are currently, you know, who used to be. Um, so, um, you know, uh, 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 craving for this attention of celebrity, etc. Maybe, maybe we, we we will come out of this where we will be able to have an inter uh, you know a proper interaction with with modernists because I think they are they they are feeling the the, the pain just as much as anybody else. Yeah. Uh, let, let me back. Let me so backtrack. Ina, a teeny. Go, go ahead, Dan. I just wanted to get Ina to to. Do, do you want? Uh, are I, you good or? Do you, Oh yeah, I, I just wanted to, to to add to the comment about creating demand. Um, art history is not taught in schools. People have no idea that these things exist. They have absolutely no idea. I tried for a decade to do uh, introduce people to faux, traditional faux finishing uh, here, not just here, Seattle area, Bellingham, the mainland. They have no idea what it is. Absolutely no idea. They say it's sponged walls, right? No, it's not. They, they just don't know that the crafts exist. Art history should be mandatory in schools. It is not. I, I wanted to backtrack a teeny bit. Uh, I, I totally agree with uh, the, and I, I mentioned learning from Las Vegas. I mean, that is the generation that we are in. And you know, there was a lot of people that were Michael Graves. I mean, those Michael Graves, especially his drawings. I mean, that's what drew me back into classicism was the axes and all of his commercial floor plans. And that started the process. So from that standpoint, there was a lot of positive from that. I mean, Charles Moore, there is a line at one point it becomes pastiche and then it's postmodern pastiche and that's not architecture. But I agree the process is, is a good process to learn from and move forward from. I'm sorry, who is, who is next? Nir, did you wanna interject or? I would, I, I'm listening to, to you and everything everybody is saying is important and you're touching on so many different aspects. And the reason all this is happening is that we're talking about something holistic and uh, things holistic at this level really touch on all aspects of life. So um, I, I, you know, I heard uh, Ina talk about, about faux finish and history and so on and so forth. Come to the CPI, create, help run the CPI round table on history. I, uh, Planos, Alejandro Planos, Come to the CPI and 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 do the roundtable on on, um, on 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 policy and life. Uh, David and, and and Daniel, come back and continue this kind of discussion with your own roundtable. That's what I meant by garden party and skipping among the tables to keep this conversation alive. And the idea that we can do this both online, in through a listserv and online in Zoom sessions that it would be really wonderful in another two, three weeks a month to have a, 
a, a, a Morales and Andriazzi uh, uh, table again and have this kind of conversation and so on and so forth for many of the of the uh, panels that we've had here so far keep the conversation going both at a deeper and a broader sense and I would actually say um, if anybody I mean this, again I'm just an architect I'm not a theologian I'm not a historian I probably got a lot of things wrong so I know there's a lot of people out there that I would love to hear their opinions and I may not like them. I mean, uh, Professor uh, Carol Westfall, who I immensely respect, Nikos, and there's a whole bunch of them. If there, if there are weaknesses in, in our presentation and our position, then let's refine them. Let's figure out how we can make them better. They hurt a little bit, but that's how you make progress going forward for a new solution. Well, and I also think it's, it's important to just acknowledge that we do have different ways of, of, you know, we, we favor certain parts of life over, the, over others. I mean, Vasari said that, you know, there's many ways to come about archite artistic excellence. You can go through the book, you can go through practice, you can go through both. So I think it's, we, it's, it's an aspect of this, for example, the people would try to characterize Henry Hobson Richardson's work. The modernist would say, oh, look, he's so modern. He's got these streamlined, you know, just solid and void buildings like the Marshall Field Warehouse and this and that. But then when H Henry Russell R Hitchcock came across his uh, Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce with all its, you know, Loire Valley dormers and this and that. He would say, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what happened there, no big deal, don't look. Well, I, I understand, you know, as a historian, you wanna find a, a nice big pattern, but you have, to, you have to look at it from the point of view of the, of the person who's trying to make a living, drawing and having a, and having a relationship with the client. This, this guy liked to play any tune that came his way the way he liked to play it. The other guy wants to tell you, you know, look at my, um, you know, my treatise, you know, look how much I know about Palladio. They're all legitimate. I'm not, you know, I happen to be more on the aesthetic side, but I've come to learn that, not, you know, if you're more into the structure and if you're more into the words, as long as the end product is something that builds towards the common good, as long as it works well and creates a harmony of parts, it doesn't matter how you got there. So I, I had the opportunity about two years ago to go to Jerusalem. And so touring Jerusalem, seeing it, and most of the city is in Jerusalem, Jerusalem limestone. From It's local, it's vernacular, it's contextual. And the, the, the tour guide that was going, he goes, you know, we just had this period in the, I think 40s and 50s and 60s where they allowed international style to come. And he goes, but other than that, the city, irrespective of archetype, all blends together. And so they basically shut that down and they said, no, you can do modern architecture, but it has to be in, in limestone. And it's amazing as you go through the city, how all of the different archetypes pay respect to the culture. And so it's a different, every, every listen, there are a lot of new cities that have no culture. So how do you deal with that? So I just, there's many different ways that this can be interpreted, but it needs to start. The dialogue needs to start. Well, I think one of the catch 22s where the modernists have us by the short hairs is that they say, okay, you know, you, you, they, someone does a billing to fit in. Well, the person who does that billing to fit in building, it, it's nowhere close to the artistic quality of all the other buildings. So then they say, that's what you want. That's total junk. And, you know, you have to build up this time and this and that. So then you say, well, look, look at, you know, in Georgetown, this colonial town in outside in DC, you know, they have, you walk down those streets, there'll be a federal building and then there'll be a neo-federal building. And honestly, most people wouldn't know the difference. I could tell you 20,000 things that are different about them because I'm obsessed at looking at buildings. So I could tell you about from the brick joints and the this and the that and the glazing, but it didn't, but no one's walking down that street offended that this building from 18, 1910 wasn't a real federal building. And, and, and of course, everyone's blown apart the endless argument of modernists copying themselves. So the idea of copying is something that really gets on my nerves because you know, you know, where the Renaissance copying the Romans and you know, you, you can go on and on about it. But at the end of the day, the modernists have this carte blanche from this because their language is so stripped down that when you look for those elements that say, oh, this is a copy, you don't see many elements by the nature of their abstract minimalism. So, so, so the moment you use a form that looks remotely like something else, oh, you've copied. Really, do you understand the composition? Or are you just saying, oh, that's a similar turn of phrase? I mean, so it's, it's, that's why I think getting down to composition, 
In other words, if you if you work entirely in a Greek revival language, but the composition is gorgeous and beautiful, like you know Greek Thompson in uh, in Glasgow or Schinkel in in Berlin, you know who says that this guy is original and this guy isn't, and this guy's a the beginning of modern architecture and this guy's a hack. That that to me is is a joke. You know, if I walk down the street and I see what's what is in theory a hack and it's beautiful. What difference does it make to me what their philosophy or theory was? Any other questions? You have a uh, your hand up, but the mute is on. If you want to comment, or Elswick, El Elise Wickalund, you could you know whoever wants to unmute themselves. Uh, hi. 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 Elise and Eric from Sweden. We actually work uh, sometimes together with Mikael Diamant. It's really nice to hear you talk about him. Uh, I have a question for Daniel. You mentioned earlier how traditional architecture appeals to us because it, it appeals to us in the way we are and modernist architecture or international style architecture appeals to us in the way their creators want us to be. Can you please develop that kind of idea and please tell us if there's sources or liter literature on that subject? It was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the movie that they played last night was a terrific movie. And that, so if you can access that, that'll probably be a, a nice portal to the science that's behind this. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, obviously Nier's book, there's all sorts of sources for these things. Um, I also suspect that you can, uh, this is what I did was read Alberti and, and Schinkel and not just the big guys, but the small guys. And you can start to infer what was motivating them. And it corresponds exactly with what science says. But specifically to your point, um, I mean, for example, the environmental biologist, Edward E.O. Wilson, uh, he really speaks about you know, earth. There's so many sources, but I would start with that film because they reference a lot of the, um, the, the neurology. Antonio Damasio is, um, is a Portuguese neurologist who wrote uh, Descartes' Error. It's a wonderful book. I learned so much from it. Descartes' Error, he was the one who split you know, the mind from the, from, from the sense, because of course the mind is so much better and the sense is the animal and you know, Kant with his disinterested beauty and, you know, and it, it drives you crazy. I mean, I, I can follow it all. I can make sense of it all. But it doesn't, none of it feels right. And it doesn't feel right because the neurologists and the scientists have shown it isn't right. Your nervous system from your brain and, and what a wonderful, beautiful brain it is, goes all the way to the very tips of your finger. It's not a brain and then the body. So when you feel something, it's the hard wiring. That's the objective beauty. The subjective beauty is the road you've traveled through life that has laid tracks by your experience, by you being a Swedish person, by you being in, you know, in that town. So, so when you and I approach a place somewhere else that neither one of us have a cultural connection to, there'll be patterns that are innate to us from our African roots, if you will. I like to say that because it annoys people. No, I'm kidding. You know what I mean though. From our roots as modern human beings. Um, and then there's elements that you and I will disagree with. You know, I like new wave music and you think it's too, too airy, whatever. And that, that'll be that. But at the end of the day, when you walk down the street with all the different layers of buildings, you know, with the way the term picturesque came was that the British would take their grand tour. They'd go to Italy and they'd see these lovely towns. They have a Renaissance monument with medieval fabric. That's eclectic. That's plural. That's pluralistic. But they spoke enough of a human language to the, to, to where together they sort of imitated the beauty that you see in nature. So, I mean, I, I'm rambling a bit, but um, I don't know. I hope that answered uh, some of your question. Good enough. Um, Pat, um, Patricia, you still have your hand up or? Hello? Yeah. Yes, um, yeah, you're on. Thank you. Um, a lot of us in this forum are the converted, if I could say that. Um, I'm interested in hearing from any practitioners who've had a success story in convincing a client that the traditional root of a design or classical or vernacular, you know, all of that is the way to go. And you've convinced the client 
to take that route and hire you instead of, you know, an internationalist, if you catch my drift. We, we you know, a lot of the presentations have been very um, enriching, but I think what's been missing is the success stories of how you've, you know, turned the tide against uh, all those that were not in agreement with. Uh, I could offer a story to that from the last two years. I've been collaborating with a very talented designer in Michigan. And he, as the architect, and he is developing into an architect. We're both Notre Dame alum. And um, he has decided to keep his practice based in his hometown in Michigan, which is a beautiful, beautifully planned um, town on the western shore of Lake Michigan. Great order to it, great um, craftsman, traditional homes and core. And his commitment is more to the urban realm. I'm more concerned with architectural substance, but we have successfully led a few clients back from even preferring a completely modern, like, hey, can we put shipping containers here? You know, that kind of approach. By, in my mind, we have to always keep the client at the center of the conversation, you know, you can educate, but you can't dictate to them because it's their money. And, you know, what good is the project if you lose the client to someone else? You know, is there room for compromise? So we found some precedent who were more transitional, modern, traditional, Hugh Jacobson being one. I'm not a fan of his work, but it was a foothold for us to begin the process of making arguments for design that was more in the interest of the public realm, harmony with the neighbors, you know, um, putting the neighborhood development in a direction that we felt was more humane, more contextual, appropriately scaled. And, um, you know, so for us, it's always a, a dance of finding the common ground with the client and then educating them step by step. I have an indirect story. It's, it, but it, it's related. Uh, when I was doing my senior thesis at Rhode Island School of Design, I was doing a sailboat racing hall of fame. And um, I went to, I was very connected to the history of Nantucket. So Nantucket's a small island off of Massachusetts. It has one of the strongest historic districts probably in the country. Um, the downtown, if you walk through it, it's like being in a historic museum. Like that's how strict every move in, that you make on every building is. And then as it goes out, it, 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 it loosens a little bit. It's an amazing place if you ever get to go. So I went to interview the person, the architect that did the original renovation for the downtown piers. So he happened to be a friend. I knew him through construction. I would, he was an architect, he's a local architect. And I interviewed him as part of my process. And I said, what is it that you, that, tell me about the process of creating and recreating these piers and all of these buildings and sticking to a, a, a Nantucket, New England traditional style that really set up the historic district and gave birth to the strength of it today. And he said, you know what? He goes, I could have made it modern if I wanted, but I just thought it was, it should be New England vernacular. And just like that, a sort of on a whim, it, it set the pace of an entire island. So we're at, we're at almost two o'clock and that's, that's the end of our session. Mm -hmm.